What can you glean about uh, phone use in the car? Um, I it's so it's so common now. Like I I I sort of have this innate anger when I pass somebody and they're on their phone. And I don't mean like they're talking and the phone is wherever it is. I mean, because I mean, like they're holding their phone and you can see it as you drive past them. I, I sort of feel like, is this that much different than if you were drinking a beer and I could see the bottle? Like, uh, what, is, what is your what is your view on that? And um, how difficult is it for an investigate? Let's assume that a crash does not rise to the level of being one of the very, very few that the NTSB looks at. Um, but, but yet it still becomes a, a manner of like, you know, a criminal prosecution or something like that. I mean, how much data are they able to infer, um, if a person wasn't actually speaking on the phone, which I assume is the easiest thing to figure out from the cell signal. So let's actually start with, if you're going 55 miles per hour and you take five seconds to look at your phone, your eyes off the road you can travel the distance of a football field. Okay, so just let that, you know, then that's playing with the radio on your phone, whatever it is, five seconds at 55 is enough to take you a football field, right? Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about this if we do more impairment stuff, but they're kind of, there's a very straightforward, you know, when you're driving, three things you need to be taking care of. Your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and your head in the game. So when you talk about distraction, anything that pulls you away from one of those is going to be a problem. And we now know that talking on the phone can degrade your performance equivalent to 0.08 alcohol kind of performance decrements. And again, we don't have to get into all the data, but there's really good data that even hands-free can do that. Because as you know, there's no such thing as multitasking, right? It's switching, etc. And so people are like, it's legal. I'm like, hands free. It's okay. It's like, no, it's not. Because if you're engaged in that conversation, then your head's not in this game, whatever. Um, and so again, I think, you know, that's one of the challenges you have when you're looking at all this is how diverse they are. So to your point, um, the NTSB will go and get all the kinds of data. Locally, they're probably never going to get that. So what would you look for? Well, and I often think about this when I do drive by those people, usually because I'm going the speed limit here and they're going less than that in a faster lane because they're sitting there staring at something, right? Um, is I'm always sitting there thinking, I know enough to basically ask the police department, get those phone records. I want to know if that was, you know, if a signal was bouncing off a, a tower somewhere locally, was that going on? And of course, nowadays we have more cameras everywhere. And so can I show that they actually were on that phone at a certain place, whether it's their video or video from a vehicle you might be in, et cetera. There are more sources for that kind of information. But to your point, if you didn't know about an EDR or, you know, video or that, uh, again, you know, an investigation of the NTSB, you can get a subpoena if the phone company won't give it to you and literally get the records to know if they were on the phone during a certain time. That stuff's available. In most crashes, insurance companies even aren't going to necessarily pursue all of that. Um, but those things would be available depending on what happened for you to, again, like any other investigation at NTSB level, you could go after that stuff to determine what was really there. I had just a couple of weeks ago, we're on El Camino here in California. So it's three lanes, 35 miles per hour speed limit. And we're stopped. And there was, uh, we had seen a motorcycle officer who had stopped somebody a while back. All of a sudden now he's coming up on the left. We're like in the middle. So there's another vehicle on the left. But the guy's coming up, splitting the lane because we're stopped. And he's literally looking in the cars because I can see his helmet turning and everything, looking in the cars. And the guy next to us was on his phone. I mean, I was sitting there just watching him, you know. And the cop came up and looked in there and like starts shaking his head, you know. And the guy put it down. And I'm thinking like, that's the difference when you actually have, you know, someone looking at you, whether it's video or something else that says you shouldn't be doing that. And you and I know that as soon as the cop went by, he's back on the phone again, right? He's got So, you know, Mark, have there been any kind of technological solutions proposed to dramatically lessen the burden of phone use while driving? And again, to be clear, I say this as someone who would um who, who would be inconvenienced by it myself, right? I'm constantly using long drives when I take them as a chance to get caught up on phone calls and listen to podcasts and audiobooks. And 
even though my hands are on the wheel and my eyes are on the road, there's no doubt, especially in a phone call, uh, it takes my head out of the game a little bit. So, so again, uh, you know, phone companies and consumers alike would be, uh, I'm sure, opposed to this. But is there no technology solution proposed to make it much more difficult to be distracted while driving? There are. It's uh, interesting because companies did oppose it quite a bit. But there are now, and you should look on your own phone, but there is usually now a button that says, don't call. You know, it's like, don't. And so you can literally, and it has a message. It'll send a text or a voicemail, basically, and says, I, I, literally, I'm driving now, call you later, or leave a message, or whatever. So there are technological things. Yes, but it still requires the user to take the action. And, and again, uh, you know, the, the question is like, how, how can you make this so that you don't have to opt into it? Right. And those could exist as well. They already do because the phones can now tell when your vehicle is moving. You're right. Right. So accelerometers and other sorts of things do that. Um, and I think what you're getting to, which is interesting, is that's a whole nother choice issue about, you know, if you're moving above a certain speed, so you're out of a parking lot or whatever else, we jam it or we just don't let it happen. Right. Um, that would be an interesting battle, I bet. For some, and that's why it's so interesting about your hypothesis there, because right now you could just make the decision. I'm going to shut it off, right? Or I'm going to put on right. airplane mode and I'm not going to get anything while I'm here. So when I was at the NTSB, um, Debbie Herzman was the chairman. And we were investigating a couple, as I mentioned, crashes where clearly cell phones were an issue. And we made a recommendation that cell phones should not be used in cars except for emergency situations. Um, and I remember exactly around that time because I used to call Debbie and we would, you know, be talking about stuff and she had a long commute <laughs> and she used to use that to catch up with all kinds of stuff. And then all of a sudden we were doing these investigations and I would keep getting her voicemail, you know, and then as we got closer to our recommendation, et cetera, I said, I know what's going on now. She goes, yeah, I wanted to know what it would be like to shut the phone off or put it in, you know, a bag in the back. And, I, and you know what? It's really inconvenient. But yeah. I'm a better driver when I'm doing this than when I'm doing it, you know, the convenient way, right? So to your point, there's the technological. That's sort of a societal. Back to our question, like, do we make that vote? And say, no, we're not going to let you do that if you're moving. But you always have the personal choice about if it's important enough to you, you can decide. And, you know, the personal choice in some cases could also mean you can differentiate. Right. It's like I'm on a strange yeah. road and I'm a little faster. I got more people in the car. I'm not going to do that as opposed to open roads, speed limit. There's nobody around. Music's not even an issue. Do you take another, you know, again, you could make more choices when you did that. Yeah. Or do I have the ability to override it? And I mean, this is how I perhaps erroneously justified in my own mind, which is I'm now steeped in the practice of identifying hot spots. And whatever it is I'm doing, if I'm listening to something or if I'm on the phone, I, you know, I at least convince myself, again, it, this might not be true, but I convince myself, okay, you're just going to pay more attention right now because this is that, inter this is the intersection and you're looking both ways, even when you have the right away or that kind of thing.